Good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for joining us for this evening's uh, BNZ Connect panel discussion in association with the New Zealand Herald Business. Um, so we're delighted to be kicking off uh, what will be a series of uh, events uh, where we're trying to look at some of the most challenging uh, issues for business right now. Uh, my name is Liam Dan. I am the business editor at large for uh, New Zealand Herald. Um, tonight we were discussing customer centricity and we're looking at how to harness the data and make it meaningful and um, perhaps get away from the, the idea of uh, hard tech. So thanks uh, to our speakers, Pip Gilbert from Dexibit, um, got Sean Fitzgibbons from TRA and Tim Wixon from BNZ. I'll kick things off by starting with some very quick introductions um, just so these guys can let you know what they do and why, why they know about this topic. So Pip. Uh, so Pip Gilbert, I am VP of product at a company called Dexibit. Uh, we power our cultural future by predicting and analysing visitor behaviour for the uh, arts, museum, cultural and commercial sector, theme parks, the like. Um, I've spent my career helping businesses grow by really focusing on customer centricity and how people can apply that in their businesses. Um, hello everyone, I'm Sean Fitzgibbon from TRA. So we, uh, TRA is a <coughs> insight agency actually, and so we use our understanding of human behaviour and data and data analytics to um, help um, yeah, New Zealand businesses grow actually. So very exciting to be here and talking about um, what we do, customer centricity. Yeah. So I'm Tim Wixon, Head of Tech Industry at BNZ. I've uh, been working with tech businesses in terms of supporting them from a capital connections and capability point of view um, through BNZ for the last five years or so. And I head up the tech industry strategy nationwide, so um, helping other bankers support tech businesses throughout New Zealand. Thanks, guys. So, <clears throat> look, I'll kick it off with a, a very sort of basic question, but I was, I was a novice uh, coming at this. And um, what I was interested to hear from you guys, and I, I guess I'll start with you, Pip, is... Uh, you know, what, what changed? We always knew uh, that businesses should be putting the customer first. So with customer centricity and all this, this, this big data um, and technology sucking that data in, uh, how, is, how is what we're looking at to, tonight different mm. to what we used to talk about? Yeah, I think that there's been a real shift in the technologies available to us. And it's not that the technologies are uh, causing customer centricity, but it, they provide us with a tool that we didn't have before to make it more accessible, uh, to make it uh, sort of democratised across a variety of businesses and not just the domain of the large corporates with the budgets that can fund uh, massive research projects. Sean, you we were talking earlier, you mentioned mm. also that it's, it's, it sounds like it's a big tech thing, but it's, it's mindset as much as it's anything. It's a lot of mindset, yeah. I mean, focusing on the customer has been around for a long time, right? You know, we've been doing focus groups before I was born and um, and surveys, but you know the mindset change recently has gone from kind of the corner office or the you know the back room or a single person within an organisation tasked with being the customer champion to now the mindset of a business of we have to be focused on the customer to grow. Everyone in the business from the front line to um, to finance have to um, understand customers and what we're doing from an organisational perspective. So data is powering it, obviously, um, but also that mindset change of we have to do this to compete is also a big catalyst for change. Yeah. Sure, Tim, from your perspective, you're, you're coming at it from a slightly different perspective, but you're hearing the tech stories, I guess. Yeah, so from our perspective, we take, a, I guess, a funding and an investment lens into businesses. So the way that data is developing in terms of being able to, I guess, show as well as tell how your customer value proposition is customer-centric, um, is a really important way of uh, getting access to either investment funds or, or bank funds. Mm. Mm. Can you throw me some uh, sort of tangible examples, and it might be really obvious things, but where the data is coming from? So uh, maybe we all see it, you know, on mm. the phone, on the internet, all that sort of stuff. But where, 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 where are you guys seeing that the data is coming from? What we find with our clients is that they need to uh, take an approach of considering every touch point that the customer has with. Uh, the experience there. So, you know, we've all been to a museum. You can put yourself in the shoes of somebody who has looked up online of when the museums open, looked at the reviews that other people have wrote, written on, you know, Google. Uh, you've turned up, you've bought a ticket, 
you have gone through a turnstile that's counted you, you've walked around the galleries all the while, your phone's crying out going, please connect me to Wi-Fi, please connect me to Wi-Fi, and that's you know, following your every move. Uh, you've you know, gone to the gift shop, you've bought something, you've maybe stopped in the cafe and had a coffee. Every single one of those things that you've done has created data along the way. And that's left a trail of data that we can aggregate and anonymize and start to uh, analyze and predict the generic or the um, sort of most common experiences that people have. And, and every business is the same. There'll be common touch points that your customers are having with your business and data being created along that journey. Mm. I think, you know, we all hear about the abundance of data and, you know, big, ch big data is going to change everything. And, but, you know, these days, you know, big data is just data, you know, it's coming from everywhere. And um, it's the great thing about insight um, is you can create insight from often free data, right? Mm. But, you know, the challenge is then trying to make sense of it. So, you know, making sure you have a solid framework in place, you know, whether that's, you know, your customer journey and your key touch points um, that your customers are interacting with you. Okay, we'll focus on the things that are really important, you know, make sure you've got your data flowing in around at the most important touch points. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise you'll be inundated and won't know where to start and it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to get harder as well. Mm -hmm. We like to encourage our customers to pick the one metric that matters most. So we had a really great example with one of our clients who uh, that what they had was a clicker counter, somebody standing at the entry to the uh, attraction who was counting the number of people going in. And that was sitting in a spreadsheet. And purely by displaying that on a time series, what they immediately were able to see is that the busiest period in that site was 2 p.m. in the afternoon. And what do you know? That's when they had their all-hand staff meeting. So all of their staff were off the floor when they were busiest. Like right there, just by getting mm. one data point, They've, be able, they've been able to make a measurable difference to their customers' experience by changing the time of that meeting. Mm -hmm. mm. Tim, I was just coming back to that investor part of it too. Like, so yeah. what this, the, the data is enabling you to get you know, quite a specific, uh, really granular picture of your business. How valuable is that when you're sitting in the, the room with the, the banker, I guess, because that's <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, so, the tough bit. So very, um, so I think there's a couple of, points that these guys raised that are kind of interesting from, a, I guess, an investor <coughs> or a funding lens. Um, and, and one of them is to be able to track what's actually important mm. to your business. So we're pretty interested in, in revenue and cash flow and those sorts of things like a bank is in terms of financial metrics. But we're also pretty interested that you um, have worked out what your lead indicators are for generating those things. Um, and so that might be foot traffic or it might be a number of hits on your website and then conversion ratios of people that hit your website and eventually that leads to those things like <coughs> revenue and cash flow that we look at quite carefully. Mm. Um, so we want to be able to see that a business is um, keeping track of those things that are important and then able to demonstrate how those things are trending um, and from our perspective that means that there's a, a funding or an investment case. Yeah, I guess one of the dilemmas, and it's a dilemma for you know everyone in business when you have all this data is um, what happens to the gut feel? Do you, do you still put some store in, in the, uh, the sort of uh, gut feel and the intuitive nous of, of, of entrepreneurs and business people, or is it um, increasingly data-led? My first question is always, why wouldn't you want to have more information at your disposal um, as long as you know what you're tracking and what's important so that you can then apply your judgment to the insights that you get from data? So. I think data is not replacing the, the judgment decision that you make, but it is giving you more objective uh, points rather than subjective gut feel to make your business decisions on. So as long as you're tracking the right things and you've got the right uh, information coming out of the noise, it's really useful from a perspective of making judgment calls or business decisions. Um, and I guess the one other point that's quite interesting is you can also then track how things change quite quickly if you do make a decision off the back of those. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I think, um, you know, making sure you've got that human element and the machine element kind of working together, right? So you've got yeah. the data feeds coming in, but, you know, humans can add that creative, you know, the creative inspiration lens. And, you know, human-centered design has come from that <coughs> where, you know, there is evidence and there's a database um, of, you know, what we potentially could do, but human-centered design gets your people up close with actual <coughs> customers to get that inspiration you need to create something different. Mm -hmm. you know? So you need to balance both sides. Mm. Yeah. Mm. At the end of the day, the data is not going to make a decision for you. Mm. You still need to make a call. 
and you can use all of the you know the tools in the world moving into you know things like machine learning and we predict uh, you know visitation for our sites but somebody's got to make a decision about how they're going to affect mm. that and so that that gut feel still has a role but why wouldn't you back it with data mm. there is more and more ability to gather data um, I know you, mm. you mentioned that picking a metric but how do you how do you sort of cut through that that feeling of being sort of swamped by data and, and, and mm. align it with your business mm. we see a lot of people get lost in the process of starting their data journey. Um, you can spend a lot of time navel gazing and writing long reports <coughs> for uh, stakeholders in your company, boards or, or whatever your, your sort of your structure is. Um, we encourage our clients, whilst that's valuable, to maybe launch a parallel process or just take a step, just get that first run on the board. And then once you have that first thing, the next number will come more naturally and then the next one. And before you know it, you'll be in a position where you're actually seeking out the information rather than being overwhelmed by it. Mm. I think probably two points for me on that, Liam, is, you know, my background's an analyst, uh, with, with where I started, and we train our analysts in a, in a very simple way, which is um, always analyse to your objectives. Like that's mm -hmm. kind of one of our mm -hmm. first things we teach them, always analyse to your objectives, and that applies to a business as well. What are you trying to achieve with the problem you're solving? Um, so you don't get swamped and inundated with data. Mm. Um, because if you know what you're trying to solve, you know, just look for the information that will help you solve that. And that's the, the first principle. The second one is, you know, this abundance of data is going to grow and it's, it's, a, it's becoming, you know, fantastic and great. But um, we need the people within the business to make meaning of that and tell the story of, you know, what's going on as well. You know, that's equally important. Um, because otherwise, you know, people who don't understand it, um, they will get swamped and confused and potentially ignore some of the facts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. Tim, I know you were uh, recently at an international conference looking at a lot of this stuff. Uh, was there a, did you come back away with a sense that New Zealand's behind the eight ball here or that it's different um, internationally in terms of what's happening? Yeah, sure. So I think um, it was quite interesting to see how well some New Zealand businesses mm -hmm. um, pitch up on the international scale, especially around design and, um, and actually customer value proposition. Um, one of the really interesting things um, that we learned whilst we were up there with a range of clients and some of the public bodies from New Zealand was how different uh, or how much bigger the scale of market is in offshore markets and, and how niche everybody is. So. There was a catchphrase that um, we heard time and time again, which was, um, in New Zealand, a business can um, do really well uh, focusing a mile wide and an inch deep, and you can tend to be all things to all people in the New Zealand market just because of the scale and how proximate everyone is. But you go to an offshore market and, and there's many more businesses that are playing in the same space as you, um, and they're focusing an inch wide and a mile deep, and mm -hmm. so they know every part of your business model much better than you do, mm -hmm. and have competed in a global context um, in a, in a much more competitive environment. Mm. Um, so I think data, if, if you can track it well in, the, in an offshore market um, and you're from New Zealand, that's quite interesting. You can perhaps understand um, trends and, and things from a New Zealand context before you go up there or as part of your preparation. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots available. Sure, do you, guys, do you guys have a sense of, you know, what's coming at us and uh, in, 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 in what you see in the industry? I think you know we're 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 a great example of exactly what Tim's talking about. Um, there's many there's many data analytics companies out there, many 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 people uh, claiming to do these things, and so what? How we're successful as a company is by really understanding our customer and focusing in a very niche way on that visitor attraction sector, and it's the 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 combination of our deep industry expertise plus our analytics competency that gives something special uh, to our customers. And we get that, and so we stick to it. And we don't get distracted by the shiny objects in the corner. We stay niche and we stay focused on visitor attractions because, again, you, you have to apply judgment and you can only apply judgment if you have uh, deep knowledge. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, you know, your question, Liam, about what's coming you know, I think obviously more of this, a greater focus on customer centricity and, um, you know, big uh, growth councils are being set up globally to purely focus on how do we 
grow in a different way, you know, so not just commercial growth now, but how do we grow from a cultural, a customer, um, and a commercial um, perspective as well. So, you know, looking at data streams and insight sources that can look at all those pieces is, um, is, is kind of what's coming as well. Um, the other element around growth in organisations and key metrics of organisations is starting to look at the purpose of an organisation. So, you know, what is your purpose within an organisation and, you know, how is that kind of driving your growth? Um, and so customer centricity is not just about solving pain points and getting the kind of the, the value chain working really well for customers, but also delivering something greater as well. Is there a sense that, um, uh, that something like whatever we call AI uh, is, is going to make it easier to process the data and to deal with it? Is that, is that sort of chore of crunching data getting, getting easier? The chore is definitely, and technology is um, it's speeding up, absolutely. Um, and, but again, it's the man and machine, you know, mm. that needs to, that's, you know, that's going to be the, getting those two things working to get the inspiration um, from the uh, amazing data that's been crunched by machines, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. What, what uh, AI technologies, and there's a whole raft of them that sit <coughs> under that umbrella, what they allow you to do is push your analytics up a maturity curve so you get beyond just describing the situation that exists and into predicting it and ideally prescribing what happens. So if I give you a, a real use case of that, um, you know, we look at queue wait times for our sites and uh, we can describe how long somebody stayed in a queue or waited in a queue. We can predict how long somebody waited in a queue using our machine learning models, but where the real value sits for those, cust for those clients that we have is being able to take actions and uh, prescribe some activity that's going to affect that. So if they can sell advanced passes so that you can jump the queue, or if they can uh, discount tickets to times when it's not so busy to encourage a greater spread of visitation so the queue doesn't uh, get jam-packed at one particular time, they're really optimising their revenue take and their growth by providing a better customer experience. Mm -hmm. And it's the technology that, that allows you to shift from description to prediction and prescribing. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I've got uh, this this question. I guess well, look, it's a hot button in the in the tech sector and um, and and everywhere at the moment. It's to do with privacy and um, obviously, if we if we're gathering that much data and you have access to that data and the ability to do very clever things with it, um, where do you how do you go about setting your own boundaries and uh, I guess ethical, but also in terms of knowing not to overstep the mark and mm. upset your customer. Um, is, is that a, a challenge for you guys? For us, it's not so much of a challenge <coughs> because we take a very hard and fast line that we don't uh, ingest any personally identifiable information. <coughs> and in fact, we had a lovely quote from a customer last week who said that they don't uh, choose Dexibit because we help them sell more to an individual customer they choose Dexibit because we help them shape the customer experience at an aggregate level. That means that customers keep coming back. And so all of our data is anonymized, aggregated. We don't even collect the personal information. Um, and so our line is very hard and fast. We're, we're in a, a relatively privileged position that we're not in the sales and marketing industry and we're not trying to target individuals or shape individuals' behaviour, mm. but we are operating at that aggregate level. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's of course, it's a very hot topic. Um, the good thing about New Zealand, the Privacy Commission in New Zealand is actually very good globally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's very clear in terms of the expectations around data privacy, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's a lot of resources there for organisations to, to tap into. The, as an agency, we've, you know, we've, we're working with big data all the time, um, and so we have to be very conscious of this. But one thing we are seeing in, in the industry and with organisations is there's a data hoarding going on. So data is valuable. I want as much <laughs> as I possibly can get, you know, and so from your auntie to your uncle and <laughs> to your, do you have a cat or your dog? Um, but when it comes to it, when it comes to that point about, you know, what is um, ethical versus, you know, um, what is um, against privacy, it's what are you using that data for and do you really need it? You know, if you want to sell me a coffee for coming into a coffee shop, do you need to know my auntie's name and whether I've got a cat or do you just need a 
tell me whether it's a cold day and mm. that, you know, yeah. that you're a loyal customer. So Yeah, I mean, uh, Tim, I don't know, from, from, you're in a different, slightly different space there, but uh, from the, uh, what you pick up from the tech sector there, is it a um, uh, pretty, pretty uh, key topic? Yeah, so a lot of our customers are um, trying to adapt to the GDPR changes because they're working in an international context. So mm-hmm. I, I guess a lot of businesses, whilst they're still innovating, are, are just trying to catch up with um, with the difference between yeah, personal mm-hmm. and uh, aggregated and, and the regulatory environment that they're playing in. So, But most are being very careful and very tactful about how they're going about it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess this, this is a thing where, and it's, it's like this with a lot of technological change, uh, businesses can be great early adopters, but you've got to kind of carry the customer along with you. If the customer isn't up with the play, uh, then, then, then it's, it's not going to play well with them, right? So yes. Mm. Yeah, definitely. If, if you put yourself in your customer's shoes and feel uneasy about how your data is being used, <coughs> then you're probably skirting a bit too close to that line. That's like a really good litmus <coughs> test because we're all consumers out there consuming a variety of things and we know what it feels like when you cross the line into surveillance rather than just tracking. The creepiness factor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the icky factor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's tangible. It's funny, like I think, you know, right now it's an interesting time because there is a fine line of organisations are now start. Uh, sorry, people are starting to expect organisations to know them better as mm. well because yeah. expectations of data and apps mm. and, and digital is, you know, is starting to drive that. Well, you know, you should know that I'm at work. You know, mm. why are you, you know, why are you emailing me at work? You know, so there's, it's, it's a fine line right now. There's a baseline expectation mm. now yeah. that you, you kind you of have, know me. you have to keep up. But don't get creepy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a little and bit of a <laughs> that first time that you get that <clears throat> message, you know, a few years back from Google or Apple or whatever it is saying, you know, you should leave now because you're 20 minutes away from your next meeting and you think, oh, how does it know that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we're all used to that now. So your, ba- your boundary changes over time as well. It would be nice to um, just quickly, maybe from each of you get a, a top tip, but keep it, keep it practical and, and some things people can, can take away. So, um, uh, and, and we might have touched them already, but by way of re- recapping, you know, what what would be your top piece of advice to uh, a business trying to sort of um, get ahead of the curve on customer centricity right now? Um, but Just get started. Pick one thing that you can do tomorrow that's really simple that you already have, and then you've got some runs on the board. So just give it a go. Um, I'd say invest in, in data curation. So you know, and, and the skill set behind that. So whether that's talent within your organisations to look at multiple data sources to tell a story, <coughs> um, or systems and processes to start to kind of pull those things together um, to give you the evidence that you need to potentially get investment through to making a change within your business. So curate, curate data. Tim? So, yeah, from a funding or investment perspective, um, I guess my advice would be know what your lead indicators are for, for your business goals. And then if you can track trends through mm. data to, to show that as well as tell a story around your business model and, and how you're gonna succeed, um, that's really valuable from an investor or, or funding lens. Mm.